Hi, my name is Elle Billing. I am a chronically ill queer femme, and I'm tired. I'm here this episode and every episode to dig at the roots of our collective fatigue, explore ways to direct our care in compassionate and sustainable ways, and harness creative expression to heal ourselves and our world. And welcome to HURF, Radical Care in a Late Capitalist Techscape. Hi, Ricky. Hi. Are you uh, giggling? Yes, you did. The, you did. You did the Wayne's World count in. So. I did. I did. I did that on purpose because we both love Wayne's World. Yeah. It was. I felt inspired, and I did it, and I was not disappointed in your reaction. <laughs> I was hoping you were paying attention. I was. Yeah. So happy New Year! Last year's done. It is. Yeet. Yeah. Ah. Uh. I mean, we've been saying that for almost a decade now. (laughs) Oh, thank God that's over. Yeah. Oh, wait, this new one's just like the old one. This is my year. But this really is my year, Ricky. Can it be my year? Oh, it can be our year. I suppose years are not zero sum. They exist regardless of who wins and loses. So. Yeah, I mean, we're all here for (laughs) it. So far. Yeah, maybe the Lunar New Year will be my year. So we are doing a special episode, kind of breaking our format as we usher in the new year. Let's put a cap on 2022, bring in 2023. We are both very geeky, nerdy people, and we wanted to talk about books. We have books. a lot of them. <laughs> but specific, we're not going to do like a top 10 or anything like that because that would be boring and annoying for our listeners. <laughs> And I don't, did we even finish 10 books this year? I did not read 10 books this year, let alone 10 books that came out this year. Let alone 10 (laughs) books that would be interesting. To other people. To other people. So we'll do like three books we read this year, Mm -hmm. whether or not they came out this year. Mm -hmm. And then like one book we're really looking forward to. Yep. Three books we read last year and one book we're really excited about this year. Do you want to go first or should I? I could go first. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what is the first book that you want to talk about that you read in 2022? What book do you whorf? Uh, The first book I chose for this year was Virginia Woolf's Orlando. Um, I'm cheating a little bit here because it's actually the first book I finished in 2022. It took Uh, you a while. Yeah, I did not start it in 2022. I actually started it in the fall of 2021. Um, But I'm not getting too bent out of shape about it, because honestly, the fact that I finished reading anything this year (laughs) is incredible. Uh, I'm still slightly below my average, like, completion rate, which is somewhere in the teens. It's so far away from, like, my grad school completion rate, which the year, the two years I was in grad school, I read like 40 books each year or something like that. It was ridiculous. And I miss that. I'm hoping to one day return to that, but just finishing books is important for me right now. I hear you on that. I have friends who do book reviews for mm-hmm. TikTok or Instagram, and they're like, yeah, I finished 150 books this year. Uh, I'm like, yeah. that's so great. I'm so glad that you do that. My mom came into my room today and she saw my stack of my to be read stack for the year. And she's like, have you even read all those? I'm like, no, that's the to be read stack. Those are the 10 books, the 10, the 10 (laughs) books I want to read this year. 10 (laughs) that I want to finish. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Orlando, Um, it's a relatively short novel from the middle of Virginia Woolf's career. It it actually came after, it was like her second book after Mrs. Dalloway, which I think is what most people are familiar with from Virginia Woolf. But the subtitle of the book is A Biography. So the full title is Orlando, A Biography. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because it is indeed a story told more of in a biographical fashion than like your typical novel would be. Um, the book is dedicated to Wolf's 
longtime lover, Vita Sacco West, um, on whom the character of Orlando is based um, to the point that like the pictures that are included in the book, there's like a half dozen or a dozen pictures in the book um, that are captioned as being Orlando. Those photos are actually of Vita Sackville West throughout her life, like as a child and moving forward. The story itself is something of a magical take on like the historical biographical novel uh, in that it takes place over the course of several hundred years and includes the plot point of Orlando changing sex and gender from masculine but sensitive male to feminine but headstrong woman. Um, and it includes so many just like lush descriptions of the grounds of Orlando's estate and stuff. Um, Orlando frequently finds himself out on the grounds looking at trees and resting by the bushes and hiding in the bushes and like even as a several hundred year old adult hiding in the bushes you know <laughs> and the narrative style of those descriptions is very i don't know like it's not it's not writerly but it's more i think intricate than conversational so like it's this weird like high low narrative style like heightened conversation almost if that makes sense that's one of the main things that drew me into the book there are, of course other plot points orlando sent to the middle east as an ambassador there's a huge blizzard in london that actually freezes the river thames solid like all the way to the bottom all the fish are frozen in place and it's this huge event that of course never actually happened but you almost think it could just the way that it's described and the yeah. way that it feels and of course there's the you know the aforementioned like gender fuckery um, and, like, all of these things are presented as extravagant and unusual in the book. Like, the book recognizes that these things are weird, mm -hmm. but also they're represented as being factually true within the book. So, like, it recognizes its own ridiculousness, I think, which is, I think, my my favorite part of the book. And, of course, the narrator, the biographer acknowledges how fallible the single biographer viewpoint can be like noting that like none of this none of this stuff can be verified but it definitely happened so like it's very funny to me um it's, it's a very funny book between the running commentary of the biographer again a very thinly veiled virginia wolf talking about a very thinly veiled uh, Vita Sackville West and the commentary about everything going on is just there's there's a lot of fourth wall breaking there that's that's amusing to me. The antics of the the characters. There's one poet and critic in the book that while Orlando is a man, this poet finds Orlando's own poetry very weak and uninspired and uninteresting. But when Orlando becomes a woman this poet finds Orlando's company just super enchanting and is totally in love with his woman <laughs> while being the same person. Like it's a, it's, it's an interesting duality and like, I can't presume to know anything more about the nature of their relationship than what I've read, but the way that it comments on the literary scene during the teens and twenties and thirties was just it was it was really funny to me. And like the the book itself is just very just playful. And I laughed a lot when I read it, just out loud, which I think is probably about the highest praise for any book that you can imagine the, the fact that it makes you like viscerally re like react to it. Um, ideally in a way that laughs, but also sometimes in a way that makes you cry, which I also did a couple of times in the book. Yeah. Most importantly though, I think the book felt real as any fantastic book can probably it's 
because of my own status as a trans poet, like I have some of those similar experiences. I mean, obviously I'm not a noble or an aristocrat or anything like that, but like the day-to-day existence of being in two different worlds like that sometimes is something that resonated with me. Possibly it's because of the obvious love that is in the book. It's, it's obviously a work of love. Um, but I think the thing that gets me the most is the way that it feels like it's just, it's like one long in joke that the reader is in on. We've mentioned a few times in this podcast, either you or guests or whomever, the way that love evolves as a series of intimate semiotic signs, like a language that develops between people that's built on common references and phases and individual gags that get blown out of proportion. And that's what feels that that's how Orlando most genuinely feels to me. Um, It feels like a love letter that is not so subtly encoded and that's somehow published and sold to the public And I have no idea how Virginia Woolf managed to do it, but I'm glad she did. And I am glad for these two gals just being pals. Historical close friend literature. Yes. (laughs) Yes. That sounds good. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. It was actually a very quick read when I did actually sit down to read it, so... Well, my first book is quite different than that. (laughs) Um, The first book I'm talking about is The Care Manifesto, The Politics of Interdependence. (laughs) I mean... Um, Written by the Care Collective. Um, So the Care Collective is um, a group of five writers from various disciplines um, who are all collectively and individually in like academic and political contexts. Um, As far as I know, several of them are British. I don't know if all of them are. I think some are from the U.S. Um, So they Mm -hmm. wrote this book in 2020 at what I think most of us thought was going to be the height of the pandemic, (laughs) 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 Uh, which we now know is, was the beginning Uh. of a very long road. Um, Mm -hmm. So their lens is very much formed by the crisis that COVID thrust us into, um, but it's also abundantly clear in the book um, that COVID revealed cracks that were already present in the system, or maybe even were not like, what's the word I'm looking for? They weren't flaws of the system. They were built into the system. They were mm-hmm. features. They're not flaws. They're features of the system. Mm-hmm. In like every Working system. Working intended, yeah. Yeah, in every system of care that our society has. So the reason I put this book first is, you know, pretty multi-pronged. Um, first, it's pretty slim. It's just oh. a little guy. I can carry yeah. it in my purse. And that's so actually how I read it. I carried it in my purse and read it in doctor's waiting rooms. Yeah. Either for my appointments or my mom's appointments, of which there are many. So it's a slim volume, but it's like packed with information and theory, and but also a lot of practical application. And one of the biggest applications for me was it informed a lot of my thought processes um, as I was developing the podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of bringing this to life. Um, I mentioned it in the first episode. I know Mm -hmm. when I, it was sort of, that was sort of the like, why am I doing this? It kind of laid out the whole point of why I was doing Horf. It doesn't explain the title, (laughs) but (laughs) it is, it's, it's a lot of what behind the why. Um, and it's also where I read the framework of caring about, caring for, and caring with, which Mm -hmm. is just a really helpful illustration for me when I'm putting together episodes and really, not just for the podcast, putting together episodes, but when I'm like looking for guests, but also when I'm doing my life. Yeah. Because my life really is focused and centered on care. That's that's how I've had to structure the whole thing. So that was first. Um, next, I like the way that the book is structured out in like concentric circles. So it starts with like our personal politics and then goes out to like kinships, community, state, economics, and then the world. So like because they're all interconnected, um, but it starts with us and then works out all these layers where care needs to be centered. And the authors really set out a solid thesis for reconfiguring literally everything about our lives to be care-centered and how 
it can look as we reevaluate how we engage with everything from family to economics to like international diplomacy. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time for me, when I think about everything, (laughs) you know, that sort of, what does John Green call it? The existential anxiety, the pressing needs of all the things in the world. It feels overwhelming and insurmountable, but this book is written in such a way that it feels possible to restructure and reinvest and re our family systems and our interpersonal relationships and our communities to really be centered on caregiving and care mm-hmm. receiving mm-hmm. so that the people who need care are getting care and the people who are providing care are also cared for and supported in a way that everybody can thrive and flourish. I'm planning on rereading it. Yeah. Um, because at the time I didn't have any notebooks. So this is like hilariously dog eared uh. and written in, but I didn't have a notebook to write in at the time. Yeah. And now I got some small moleskin notebooks that also fit in my purse. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I can take things with me when I go and read at home too. Yeah. But it's just, it was so good it's you know you talked about you know a book is good when it makes you laugh out loud i nod out loud when i (laughs) reading (laughs) it's like yeah yeah and like i'm dog-earing the top corner and it's like i already dog-eared this page but now i need to dog-ear the bottom of it because there's another thing i want to (laughs) remember and like i'll underline things i have different codes i have stars and i have underlines and i have brackets and i have double underlines and (laughs) yeah it was it's just it really shifted the foundations of my thinking going forward and i think almost everything i read from now on is going to be sort of viewed through that lens yeah i think it's pretty good praise that it ended up causing this like we wouldn't really be here if we weren't interested in the contents of the book in some way to begin with right so yeah i actually might have to read that as well (laughs) You know, it so. would fit in a small envelope. I could send it to you <laughs> or or get you a copy because my marginalia and your marginalia are different. Yeah. I think we have different note-taking methods. Yeah. And that yours exists. And, <laughs> <laughs> and mine's yeah. like, oh, I, maybe I mean, I'll come back and read that one day. <laughs> and mine is, it exists, but it's chaotic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one reason. It's funny. I still have the Bible that I used to take to Bible camp in high school. Like, and I never, it's a teen one and I never updated it when I went to college or like became an adult and I'm 37 now and I still have my high school Bible because it has all my marginalia in it. You have the student Bible, don't you? I do. It's like a teen study Bible. Yeah. Yeah. I think I have, I'm pretty sure I have the same one except hardcover because yours is like a zipper sock cover, right? It's a floppy zipper one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I have the same one. I got it for, I think I got it for my confirmation. I mean, my margin notes are very likely not applicable to me anymore. Yeah. But, like, I don't want to not have them. Yeah. (laughs) Because that's how I take notes. (laughs) I drew the Starship Voyager in my original copy of the the Big Blue Catechism, so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, that's what I was doing in confirmation Luther was going class. where no one had gone before. <laughs> <laughs> Except lots of people went where Luther went. All right. So what's your oh, second book? <laughs> okay. Um, actually, my second book is a little connected to your first book. Okay. In a very existential way. Um, my second book is uh, Selected Works of Audre Lorde, edited by Roxane Gay. Ooh. Yeah, um, I purchased this book entirely on a whim this spring in Twin Falls, Idaho, at the Barnes & Noble, um, because I needed something to read. That is not true. I went to <laughs> Barnes & Noble. I went to Barnes & Noble, and things to read just sort of appear in your hand at Barnes & Noble. That happens every so, time we go to bookstores. It's true. Point is, bought it on a whim. Um, I really wasn't looking at for anything particular, but I happened to be in the sociology-ish section because Barnes & Noble is weird in its classifications. And I just, I happened to see it on the shelf and the cover caught my eye. And I knew that like my knowledge of Lord's work 
was lacking. I have, of course, heard or read a number of her famous quotes, probably the most famous being, your silence will not save you. I noticed that it had both essays and poetry in it because, I mean, she was a poet first and foremost, and like a public intellectual in general. But like the thing that got her where she was was her poetry. So I decided to pick it up as just like your like a general introduction to her work, which is kind of the point of books like that. And I think it's a really good introduction to Lord's work. Props to Roxane Gay for uh, collecting this edition and, and the choice of the pieces that are in it. And the reason that I say that is the collection doesn't just include famous essays, but I mean, there are some of the big ones in there. The, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and the transformation of silence into language in action, which is where the your silence will not save you line comes from. Mm-hmm. But it also includes um, lots of journal entries of hers from her cancer journals and, of course, poems from across her entire career. All of her books are represented in there in some way. Of all of the content that's in the book, I think the thing that I was most surprised by and struck me the most was her journaling. Because, like, I'm a writer and I have no idea how she produced so many pages while being so ill, so busy, and traveling, like, all over the world. I genuinely had, and I think still have, an existential crisis when this, like, realization hit me that, like, not only was it difficult for me to me to imagine being that prolific, I couldn't imagine paying for all of those airplane flights and medical treatments and the writing and teaching resources that she had, all of that stuff while also actually writing. Like, it's just, it blows my mind the amount of work that she was doing. And it's genuinely impressive to me. My conception of it is like a whole other time system from normal people. Like there's that line in Men in Black where like, he's like, they run on a 36 hour day or something like that. And like, either you get used to it or you go insane. And I feel like I would be the person that would go insane in Mm -hmm. under that workload. Like the work that she did is, it's so much work. But the other thing that I got from her journals was how fierce her love for humans actually was. Like, like how genuinely loving she was. Like, through the essays, I could read about her anger and her criticisms of racial and sex and gender stratifications in the United States. The way that she criticized the medical field in America, for example exemplified how cold and uncaring it was, especially toward women and further toward black women. But when she spoke of people who were truly trying to listen to her, spoke of the students that she missed and the partners that she loved and the people who called her That's where she showed the most how she viewed the world and all of its love and all of its light. And I'm sure it's a book that I'll come to back in the future, not just for the theory and rhetorical part of it, but like for the hope that's actually in that book. Like the way that she embodied hope in so many massive structural problems was something that that really, really struck me. Thank you for sharing. I remember you reading that one too. You were there when I got it. Yep. And you were here when you were reading it. So my second book is an art book. So it's a pivot from my first book too. Um, Mm -hmm. Early in the year, in 2022, um, I was working on a body of work, my Bear Country collection. Mm -hmm. Um, those paintings with the Berenstein Bears pages collaged in between the paint. Um, And I got to that really dreaded stuck point um, where I knew the paintings weren't done, but I wasn't sure what I needed to do next. Mm -hmm. And I was really stuck. (laughs) 
Um, and I stumbled onto a fellow artist's um, 100 Day Project, which is a really popular thing on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, and she was doing 100 days of asemic writing. So I already include a lot of text in my work. Um, and so I was immediately like taken in by this artist's daily posts. Um, so I, of course, did an ADHD <laughs> and bought <laughs> four books on asemic writing and read them in like two or three days. <laughs> yeah. It was like the most reading I did this year was like in that two or three days. Um, so of those four books, I picked um, one of them to be my number two book. And it's the Cecil Tushan Asemic Reader, which to me is a very amusing title. <laughs> so <laughs> asemic writing is text without meaning or yeah. like abstract calligraphy. Wikipedia defined the word asemic as like having no specific semantic content or writing without the smallest unit of meaning. Mm -hmm. So to have a book called an asemic reader is a bit of an oxymoron, which I enjoy greatly. I find that mm -hmm. very funny. <laughs> but the book itself um, is com was compiled by the artist himself in 2019. Um, and it is a look back at a lot of his work over the years. Um, so some of them are done in freehand media. So like ink, pencil, pen, things like yeah. that, brush. Yeah. Um, some are done with found texts and then freehand media superscribed over them. So like a book page okay. or yeah. a page of music, and then they're scribbling and writing done yeah. over top of them. Um, and a large number of them are found text or stenciled text, which were then like cut up and then rearranged into a collage where okay. none of the letters were totally discernible. And they definitely huh. couldn't be put together to be read into any yeah. meaningful text. So the whole book is just really a study on the possibility of text once you remove the burden of making meaning from it. Um, and it's a very accessible introduction to the to that art form, which was more accessible than the first book I read, which was all like the academic oh yeah. Like overview of asemic writing, which I also yeah. find interesting, but like yeah. not great for a top three books of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um the picture book. Like this is it's an art book. It's all like high quality photos of the guy's work. Oh. Yeah. It's it's beautiful. Like I said, some of them are collaged, some of them are handwritten, hand stamped, hand scribbled. Um and going through these, especially the scribbly text, like mm -hmm. some of them were very much like Cy Twombly, if you're familiar with his work. Yeah. Um, really unlocked some possibilities for me in terms of mark making in my art, which already includes found texts like children's books and dictionary pages. And I was actually able to finish my series of paintings, and I was really happy with how they turned out. Yeah. And I work in themes of identity and memory, and I live with neurological problems like migraine disease, and I have a parent who has a progressive neurological illness. And so the whole concept of writing without creating any meaning from the writing is really provoking for me especially as communication becomes more challenging in our home. So the plans I have for this year with my art and my body of work are really largely influenced by my studies and experimentation from this really like deep dive into asemic writing that I've mm -hmm. done. So I guess at the end of the day, you can take the English teacher out of the classroom, but <laughs> I'm going to keep deconstructing and reconstructing text yeah. until I die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just... It unlocked a whole new direction for my art and it's like i'm just I, yeah. I ended up building like making handmade pens and buying some other dip pens and really getting yeah. into like the possibilities of like writing without having to create words and yeah. developing like my own calligraphy alphabet that isn't actually letters like but it's my own personal alphabet of marks and it's just it's been really powerful for yeah. me yeah and exciting and yeah it's interesting to me that like even i think even before you made a deeper dive into that like we both follow artists that use both follow and know artists that use not just text but like text like marks Mm -hmm. or like things that look like they could be writing but aren't exactly i just think it's interesting when people get like academically into something that they appreciate aesthetically it's like really asking yourself why you like something and then 
like you go and buy four more books you or do whatever. ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> Hyper focus on it for a while. <laughs> and then you get to the end and you're still you're still not exactly sure. <laughs> you're just like, you know, I know all this, but I still don't quite know. I think so, I will construct some pens out of soda cans and see what yeah. comes of this. Yeah. So it's 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 very interesting. My third and final book for 2022 is Gnosticism by Stephen A. Heller. Um, I ended up buying this for a lot of the same reason that I bought the Audre Lorde book, actually. Um, like, I was peripherally aware of the things inside it, and I knew that those things already had influenced my thinking in some way because they had influenced things that I was directly influenced by. Um, like, I even wrote a poem a few years ago called Gnosticism, and my thesis advisor was like, I can't believe you actually managed to pull this off. And so <laughs> I was like, so I was like, yeah, I suppose I could actually learn something about it. <laughs> so the book itself is like a mildly biased account of the history of uh, capital G Gnostic thought. Um, particularly in the West, and it's a very basic primer of Gnostic beliefs. It was the second part that I was most interested in because, like I said, an, a lot of the authors and artists I follow and I'm influenced by have been described as Gnostic with a, a capital G. Um, probably the most prominent um, of them is the author Philip K. Dick, who wrote a lot of science fiction novels that have been turned into movies and like he himself specifically described having a vision of God at one point in his life. And like his works often dealt with the nature of truth and reality. And like they feature antagonists that insert a false reality into the worlds of the protagonists. There's a whole list of movies. Um, Blade Runner was based on one of his stories, right? Blade Runner was based on his novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The Total Recall movies were based on a short story of his. I think most people have seen, most people that have seen a Total Recall have seen the original one with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. It was early 90s, I want to say. Um, it's a very strange movie, very specifically about the nature of reality and stuff like that. Um, like, there's a whole, like, implanted memories thing and Sharon Stone's in it. And anyway, Philip K. Dick um, is a Philip K. Dick story. And so, like, I, I decided to actually look into Gnosticism, like, more seriously, more studiously. Um, and so I did. There's a reason that I call it mildly biased, and that's because the author, Stephen Heller, is specifically the bishop of a Gnostic organization that specifically aligns itself with a very particular view of like post-Christian thought. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it has a very specifically big C Catholic slant to it. And, like, I understand that Catholicism is very much into ritual and symbolism and all that. But I, I just found it very interesting that a group based on individual knowing and truth would be so interested in organizational hierarchy and traditions and rituals that are like strapped onto that belief system that is so rote and organizational and has been itself a source of so much persecution to Gnostic thinkers over history. So like, it rubbed me the wrong way a little bit, but like also I say that as someone who grew up in a very conservative Lutheran church, which is also very opposed to the Catholic Church, but also is built upon it. So like it was an interesting study in a way that 
things historically could have gone if I was if I grew up in a different group. Like two thirds of the book went a long way toward helping me understand a lot of writing and music and film that I've consumed in the past like decade and a half or so. And where so many of those ideas originally came from, especially the the dualist like mind versus or body versus spirit sort of light dark truth chaos you know all of all of that stuff that's that i find very interesting both as a person and as a writer um it was it was very good for me to learn about the things that i've already known i guess yeah <laughs> I think it's interesting the order that we put our books in. Yeah. Um, we prepped separately. The order of our books has kind of worked out well. Um, so your la your third book was on Gnosticism, and my third book is a faith based book. So we both uh, like placed yeah. our third book as being it's a religious book. Mm -hmm. Um. So I mean, my third book maybe could have been first because the title is Start with Hello, <laughs> <laughs> but I put it last because I read it last. Um. <laughs> And because it's a little more complicated for me than the other ones I read. Um, so the book, the full title is Start With Hello and Other Simple Ways to Live as Neighbors. And it was writ written this year. It, it's actually the newest book on my list, too. Um, written this year by Shannon Martin. Um, I, where does she live? Indiana? Goshen? Is that in Indiana? Yeah. Yeah, I've actually been to Goshen. Yeah, I think that's where she lives. Yep, Goshen, Indiana. Yep. Um, so uh, this book came across my Instagram in the stories of an art another artist that I follow. Um, so I pre-ordered it, and I was—I actually got an advanced copy to read and review. Mm. Um, so I'm just what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the review that I wrote after I read it earlier this fall, because mm -hmm. um, I think what I already said then is th basically the same thing I want to say now. Yeah. Um, but I'm, my disclaimer is that even though I got an advanced copy, um, I paid for the book. It wasn't, yeah. I'm not, I wasn't compensated for my review. I'm not being paid now to do, to put this on my podcast. Um, it's not a review for hire or anything like that. I volunteered for the group because I was interested in what Shannon had to say. Mm. Um, so this book specific, so here's where my review starts. <laughs> um, so this book is for my white church friends. <laughs> Shannon Martin has a style of writing that is inviting but gently challenging. She will quickly gain your trust and affection and then coax you out of your comfort zone. Too many of us, being us white church people, um, are comfortable. And I'm reminded of my ex-husband's priest who said his job was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. If we as the body of Christ, which is what we are supposed to be in the church, are supposed to comfort those who are afflicted, then we must be the comfortable ones that need to get a little less comfortable in our positions. If you watch the news, it seems that the evangelical church is always scared of something. But didn't the words fear not get repeated in scriptures quite often? Shannon encourages us readers to meet our neighbors where they are, to start with hello, and to recognize that yes, we are all probably afraid of something, but it doesn't have to be our neighbor. Okay, now me as a queer disabled person is stepping out of my review. <laughs> <laughs> um, as the white church person. Now I'm speaking as a more marginalized person. The institutional church manufactures fear. And if we were truly living in community, um, the fake fear crap wouldn't work because we would know that our LGBTQIA plus neighbors are not grooming our children. Um, we would know that immigrants are not invading our communities, and we would know that our non-white neighbors are not up to whatever the talking point of the week is. We would know all of those things are just talking points that are manufactured to create fear and control. At our core, we are tired folks with messy houses trying to get our kids to school, pay the bills, and live another day. And so is the person next door. And that's the thrust of Shannon's book. Yeah. As a critical reader, I had some initial misgivings about certain parts of the book, namely that it's written by a white person. However, I was comforted in most of them. Shannon addressed the vast majority of my concerns about white gaze and white saviorism in just the right places. Like literally, as I was reading and thinking, hmm, this could be construed as white saviorism, almost the next paragraph, she addressed that exact concern mm -hmm. and said, 
if this is your attitude going into this, you probably need to check yourself. <laughs> yeah. Like that's not yeah. the point. Um, she knows her audience and she's very adept at speaking to them. Um, the book is a good starting or continuing place for non-melanated church folks <laughs> who <laughs> want to be better neighbors or who need to be called in by someone who can provide practicable steps towards opening up their humanity. So for that particular audience, mm -hmm. it is a very good book. Yeah. And I really did enjoy reading it. Yeah. The next best step would be to read a book by a Black, Indigenous, or person of color. And Shannon Martin even writes that asking your neighbors what they need or being available when a friend asks for help, that's the point. Making assumptive yeah. leaps to provide what we think we should do, but that isn't needed or wanted is problematic. Yeah. And so by reading books written by Black, Indigenous, and people of color is how we find out how yeah. to be good allies. In the episode with Maria Llanos, she mentioned Donna De Prima and that it takes pushing at the thing from all sides. Yeah. And not everyone's ready to read a book by by a Black author. Mm -hmm. As much as I want everyone to read one, yeah. not everyone's at that place yet. And it's very possible that this is the book that will reach people where they need to be reached. Yeah. The author, she's a gifted writer. And she's... I personally vacillate between being gentle and being very abrasive with people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I really struggle with that. Um, yeah. To be gently challenging to people is a gift. Yeah. And this book is so good at that. I mean, yeah. and she has soup recipes in there. Like, <laughs> here, like, <laughs> it's like, oh, and here's how you do taco night with your neighbors. Like, <laughs> it doesn't have to be complicated. This can, yeah. you start simple. Get to know yeah. the people who live next door. Yeah. Go to your neighbor kid's football game. Like, you can't be a good neighbor if you don't know who your neighbor is. Yeah. And that's that's the whole point. Yeah. I mean, and if I believe th that all we have is each other, if I don't know who that other person is who lives next door or across the street from me, like, how can we be there for each other when the shit hits the fan? Yeah. And what do we have? You actually reminded me... Um, in Mare's episode, um, that that coming from all sides thing, it it jives with <laughs> some something one of my therapists said once actually um, was um, she had as a visual she was a she was a visual aid sort of person quite often, and one of the things that she had in her office was one of those plastic like expanding ball things i don't know if you're like mm -hmm. you pull on it and it it becomes like a larger ball and then you squish it and it looks like it it's like a 3d asterisk is what it kind of looks like and it's like the the plastic pieces are all jointed and yeah and you pull yep. on it and then the ball gets bigger and one of the things that my therapist said was like, you can pull on any one thing and the whole thing expands. So like, even if you start at some little point, dinner or giving a birthday card or taking out the trash or something for your neighbor, like that one thing expands your world that much more. So, like, if you're a white people and you only read books by other white people, it's a good place to start in order to read books by other not white people. Mm -hmm. um, any small thing is better than nothing at all. And it's especially better than actively continuing to be awful. <laughs> so, yeah. Should we get to the, the next year's books? Yeah. What are you excited to read? For so, 2023. This year, I am going to read Masamune Shiro's Ghost in the Shell, which is a manga that was written in 1989. And the reason that I'm reading it is actually, like, part of it is the Gnosticism interest um, from earlier. And the book itself deals with that dualist idea of mind and body and soul and body, but also because it's a direct influence on a lot of my cult my direct cultural influences. And I'm hoping it will be itself a direct influence on 
um, a writing project that I'm working on now that I've actually been working on for well over a year. When I first started working on this project, I wrote down a bunch of things that I thought might be useful to read or reread. And that was actually one of, I think it was like one of the first five things that I had written down. And I mostly became aware of the book from two main sources. The first one was knowing that it was one of the books that the Wachowski sisters made the whole cast of the Matrix movies may require it was required reading for people that worked on the Matrix movies. And then the second point was knowing that the anime that came out in the 90s that was based on the manga is one of my spouse's most favorite pieces of media ever. The manga itself came out right in the middle of cyberpunk, which basically ran from like 1980 to 2000 or so was mm -hmm. basically what I would consider the cyberpunk era. But like in 1989, I wasn't really into either manga nor anime because I was nine and I grew up in Fargo, which is weird because like I was knee deep in Transformers fandom at the time. <laughs> And like, I, I was just super fascinated with huge robots and stuff, but like, I didn't really get into anime until I saw Princess Mononoke. So like, I missed out on the first like few waves of anime and manga hitting the US. I'm trying to rectify that while also doing research for a project and further connecting with my spouse, like 20 years into our relationship. <laughs> So the book itself has been sitting on our shelf for like a decade. And so I figure I should probably get around to reading it <laughs> finally. Cool. So I'm going to do that and I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Well, my last book of 2022 actually segues really well into my first book of this year. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I said the next best step is to read a book by a black writer. Mm -hmm. Um so back in November, um, I took a challenge from Nikki Black, and she did a challenge called No New Books November, which was really interesting to me because she had all the stats about how sales of anti-racism books exploded in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, but like nothing has actually changed <laughs> mm -hmm. culturally, even though we're all consuming these books, right? Yeah. So clearly there's a disconnect between our supposed reading habits, and how we're engaging in the world. Um, so the No New Books November Challenge, I went through that. And it, as part of that, I shopped my shelves for books that I already own, um, but I haven't read or hadn't read well, hadn't yeah. finished, forgot to read, or forgot I had, or whatever. So and the, the first step was to like look at what you already own. And the aim of the challenge was to change how we read, to read for liberation and not just for consumption, mm -hmm. and not just to get ally points. I pared it down to 10 books, like just 10. I'm committing to reading or rereading them over 2023. Um, and the first one, and I'm so excited, is uh, Rest is Resistance, a manifesto by Trisha Hersey, mm -hmm. the founder of the Nap Ministry. Mm -hmm. um, Trisha Hersey is also known as the Nap Bishop. She's on Instagram. She's incredible. I tell literally everybody <laughs> to follow her. Like, I'm excited about the poetry in my stack of books, too. Some of them are books you've given me um, that I've read already, but I really want to, like, soak them in. And I'm excited about the other books, too. But, like, I pre-ordered this one as soon as I heard about it, and I've been super excited um, and, like, dreaming of what possibilities lie within the covers. Yeah. Um, the long and short of it is that hustle and grind culture is completely tied up in white supremacy. Yeah. Like, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um. And to divest from white supremacy, we have to rest. I mean, it is work. Like, as allies and as white people, we have to work to dismantle white supremacy and the ways we benefit from it to, at the cost of other people. But part of that resting is part of divesting from hustle and grind. More than letting ourselves rest, we have to let other folks rest too. Yes. I'm a huge fan of napping. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um much to the chagrin of my mother. Um, but especially with my body, mind the way it is, I, I have to nap. But the book goes a lot deeper than that. Just an example um, from the Nap Ministry's face, um, Instagram page is that loitering laws were originally written to force freed Black Americans to get a job 
because mm-hmm. white folks couldn't stand to see black people enjoying their free time. Like that's literally why there are loitering laws that exist on the book still to this yeah. day. If we're going to dream of a better world or a different world, we have to be able to dream. Mm-hmm. And dreaming comes from resting, sleeping, daydreaming, taking a five, and creating the space and allowing the space for other people to do the same. Grinding is for coffee, not for people. <laughs> Which is a very flip way of saying it. Um, right. Like, it's much more serious than that. But, like, yes, I'm a small business owner, but, like, you will not find me grinding. <laughs> right. I work maybe three hours a day. That's all I yeah. can handle. Um, I mean, we we regularly talk about both of us having the mental or physical space to actually work on this or our other other individual projects yeah i mean specifically this is day this is is the the second time we had rescheduled to do this recording Mm -hmm. like between physical pain brain pain and then like yeah yeah i mean there's a reason we only do two episodes a month and it's because we need to rest i think about my grandma she napped every single day yeah i mean she got shit done but she always napped like you got to take care of yourself. I'm so glad for books. They make me happy. Mm-hmm. We horf books. Thanks for chatting about your favorite recent reads with me. Yeah. Thanks for indulging my my idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. I like yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. And all of these books are going to be in the horf podcast bookshop.org storefront. Um, We'll put a link in the show notes so people can go easily find the titles. That is an affiliate link. We do get like a 10% kickback if people order through the link. But hey, got to pay the bill somehow. And Bookshop is like the ultimate not Amazon. So Yeah. Oh, they're so good. It's super cool if you have a favorite bookshop or one nearby that you don't get too often enough or whatever that like you can just help out your indie bookshop even by buying online it's it's really cool i love their site yeah well you have a fabulous 2023 i intend or to. you know what let's let's have a survivable 2023 yeah set reasonable have attainable a, goals have a 2023 yeah let's have a year <laughs> <laughs> all right well okay. thank you so much Mm -hmm. And we will see you around. Thank you for joining us on this episode of HORF. To view the complete show notes and all the links mentioned in today's episode, or to get a full transcript of the episode, visit HORFpodcast.com. That's H-O-O-R-F podcast.com. Before you go, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you can receive new episodes right when they're released. And if you're enjoying our podcast, I'd love to have you leave us a review in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are one of the major ways that Apple ranks their podcasts, so even though it only takes you a few seconds, it really does make a difference for us. Become a patron. For $3 a month, you can support the creation of this podcast, pay my editor, and join a community of fellow caregivers out here just doing our best. Thank you again for joining me, Elle Billing, in this episode of HORF. Until next time, be excellent to each other. Horf is hosted by L. Billing at L and Wink. Audio editing by Ricky Cummings at Ricky Poo. Music composed by Ricky Cummings. Horf is a production of Ellen Wink Art Studio, all rights reserved. Horf Podcast can be found on social media channels at Horf Podcast, at H O O R F Podcast.